that, first of all, allow me on behalf of the People's Progressive Party to thank you for coming here today. I have no doubt the, about the purpose and the usefulness of your presence. But I also have no doubt that the government and its acolytes in the media will seek to characterize this gathering here as one of the racist PPP crying foul when there is no justification for what they're saying. Because that is part of their plan. So I ask a few questions. Are we being unreasonable when we accuse this government of all that it has been accused of here today? That is discriminating against people, practicing militarization of the state, victimizing people on the basis of their race and their political affiliation. If the answer is no, then I think the fault has to be ours in the People's Progressive Party that until today, we have not had this sort of conversation at the national level. And we have, because we have been engaged for 23 years in nation building, focusing on changing Guyana for all of our people. And the records are there to show how not only our country has changed, but the lives of our people, all people, have changed. But why is it that the doomsayers and the fringe elements and these so-called social activists who accuse us of racism still have a receptive ear in many quarters of our country? Why is it so in the face of this glaring evidence of progress of all of our people? And I believe we have been so engaged in nation building that we have not taken time enough to speak about the glorious record of the People's Progressive Party in nation building and in our people. And so today, at a, earlier today at a press conference I had, I said, we are prepared to go through a fact-based analysis of the state of Afro-Guyanese under APNU, under the PNC, under the People's Progressive Party in the period 1992 to 2015, and the state today. Yes. We are prepared to do that. <laughs> and the evidence will show that in 1992, and most of you, as Donald Ramatar said, the public service was dominated by Afro-Guyanese, and until today, it is still dominated by, by Afro-Guyanese. In the 70s, public servants were the middle class in this country. By 1992, they were pauperized by a PNC government when the minimum wage fell to 25 US dollars a month by the time the PPP got into office. You remember the case of teachers and, and nurses and doctors and, and other public servants having to hustle outside to make a living because the public service salary was not, was not adequate to maintain a decent life to even feed their family. That's, uh, that's the PNC's record with afro Guyanese pauperizing the public service because they were fixed income earners.
Contrast that with the situation when we left office from where we took over. Wages in the salary um, and salaries in the public sector have moved up in a real terms by over 600%. We have moved the public servants back into the, the middle class in this country. That's our record. If you look at how many afro Ghanis own a piece of land in 1992, you will find at least 40,000 more who own a piece of land in 2015 than, than in 1992. If you look at the number of vehicles owned by afro Ghanis in 1992 and compare that with today, then you will see Hundreds of thousands of vehicles more are owned by afro -Ghanis. If you look at black-owned businesses in Guyana, because in 1992 there was practically no business, not government, not private business. But if you look at black-owned businesses today in Guyana, from hairdressing services, taxi services, security services, computer services, contracting services, companies, supermarket services. You will see at no point in our entire history, our entire history from slavery to today, that afro Guyanese have owned that many businesses. And uh, most of that growth took place in the 23 years of the People's Progressive Party. And you know why I'm mentioning this? I'm mentioning all of this because the, the demagogues are using this element, this accusation of discrimination without any fact-based analysis to now theoretically argue that since the PPP um, discriminated against afro guyanese this period is a period for correction of that, that discrimination. That is what they're arguing. So we need to destroy, we need to destroy this myth, this fallacy, this propaganda that afro guyanese did not make progress under the PPP. I've only dealt, I've only dealt with one element, but in every single area, in terms of rights, in terms of rights, if you look at the changes to our constitution, we have one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. We have serious protections and separation of power. We've respected the institutions that Anil Nandelal spoke, spoke about, even when they went against the executive. They ruled against the executive. We respected their ruling. The complaints before the Ethnic Relations Commission asked Edge Hill. The Ethnic Relations Commission investigated all of those complaints about hiring in the public sector and private sector and, and scholarships and everything else. And when you look, at, you look at the reports, you will see that there has been no institutionalized racism against afro guyanese practice by the People's Progressive Party. The reason I'm telling you all of this is that one can excuse sporadic cases of discrimination because no government can answer for every person that they put in every entity. And people often act based on their own philosophy, their own outlook on life. Some might be pure racist, and you can't blame every government for that. But you can definitely blame a government when the practice of racism starts to become institutionalized. And what we have seen now is this practice of discrimination on the basis of two grounds, race and politics, becoming institutionalized. And there is a theoretical, philosophical underpinning a justification for this. So we heard the chairman of the Revenue Authority mused about the geographic location of taxpayers or taxpaying. It was not the geographical 
location of tax paying he was talking about. It was the ethnic um, location of tax paying services. We have seen another employee of the government, Eric Phillips, argued that afro guyanese only own 3% of the assets of the country. One person, when we discussed it at our MP meeting, said Odinga Lumumba alone own 3%. <laughs> and say 3% of the assets of our country. And he argues now that afro guyanese came here before even the Amerindians, many Amerindian tribes. So that somehow the state which has acquired the same nature of the colonial state is responsible for correcting this historical wrong and must deal with transferal of assets to afro guyanese based on this number that he called, which has not been tested. Today at my press conference I asked, if you live in South Georgetown and you own a home and the man in Essequibo Coast and you're afro Guyanese, and you, the man on the Essequibo Coast, he owns 12 acres of land because land seems to be the big issue. Land is the communal lands, etc. He owns 12 acres of land on the Essequibo Coast, so he plants the right. If you attempt to monetize the holdings, to sell the house in the Georgetown or sell the 12 acres of land in the Essequibo Coast, you will get more money for the house in Georgetown. So when you do an assessment of ownership, it is by far way above what Eric Phillips has been talking about, and he's a member of this government, talking about at various conferences around the, the country, and using that as the basis for, to push the government, to push the government into enacting policies that are discriminatory, that are discriminatory. Let's look at Carl Greenwich. Carl Greenwich recently said, at a conference that we discriminated against afro guyanese in giving national awards. Most of you know it's not true. I didn't give national awards for several years, and when I did, I had to point out to him that from the finance sector, I, the five persons who were there, Clyde Rupchun, Kurshid Sattar, Lawrence William, Donna Yearwood, and, and Lennox Benjamin, three of them were afro guyanese but they thrive on misinformation that the PPP somehow discriminated against, against afro guyanese and they use this all to justify, to push the government. Look at the last activity that the president spoke at. The activity to celebrate a decade, indigenous, uh, a decade of people of African descent. And two speakers there said Lincoln Lewis and, and this Heinz. They both said to the people who were sitting in the audience that we supported this government and therefore the government has to meet our demands. This was not a political act act activity. This was an activity for afro guyanese They assumed automatically that every afro guyanese in that group voted for PNC. Is this not racist to make that assumption? And nobody would say anything about that. Nobody would say that they're racist. If, if the PPP, by speaking out against discrimination against indo guyanese is accused of racism, then you have, I said today, that in this government, you have a bunch of races because that of sometime in the past they have all spoken about some discrimination against Afro Guyanese. That's the first point. The second thing is that when I say this, they forget that we also speak about 
the political discrimination. Because two types of discrimination. Look at Carville Duncan standing here. Look at Carville Duncan. Carville Duncan is perceived, maybe, to be supportive of the People's Progressive Party. He is before the courts now accused of stealing $20,000 a month. <laughs> that is the ridiculous nature. Facing court criminal charges against him based on a perception which might not be true. I don't know if Carville supports the PDP, <laughs> but, but the perception is that if you're black and you support the PDP too, you'll get confronting it. The Amerindians, the first week of this government in office, the biggest act of discrimination for the past 50 years in the Western Hemisphere took place against the Amerindians. 2,000 of them nearly were sent home. And you know what they were told? They were told that these were PYO people and PPP activists. You know what the government has done now? It has started with the litmus test of politics. Jaskin spoke about it. The litmus test of politics now, about who you vote for now, will determine your employment within the government. Ask anyone if the PPP in any interview required them to vote for the PPP or ever ask them who they voted for in the last elections. And then you will see the difference. And so we have absolutely, absolutely no apology to make about the PPP's time in office. If you look at the allocation, budgetary allocation, through which a government practices its policies, you will see if you add the subsidy to, to region 9 allocation that that's the region on a per capita basis that got the most money under the PPP and it has always been supportive of APNU. Always been. No, region 10, sorry. Region 10. Always been supportive of the PNC. But we did not discriminate against those people here, Guyanese too. Eric, they, they, Hines said, this government cannot be discriminating against indo guyanese because look how much money it's spending in sugar. Look how much money it's spending in sugar. And I, I said, well, how can we be discriminating against afro guyanese in the past? In, when in Region 10, we built a Amelia's Ward from scratch, from, from bauxite lands and Block 22, two spanking new schemes, a new hospital, water treatment plant, the road steer, um, a, 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 a whole range of other things. Secondary schools, two secondary schools, power plant, a new power plant went in there, and we subsidized electricity. How come with all of that spending we are racist? And, and you're arguing now because they spent $8 billion in sugar, $8 billion in sugar, then you can't, that, that they're not, they're not discriminating. The essence of the issue with sugar is the signal. And as I spoke about the theoretical underpinning, the quiet whispers about this transference. So sugar is PPP support, Indian people. So yes, we put in $8 billion in subsidy, but we can't find $1.7 billion to keep wells open, but we can write off 20 billion for DDL, and we can then subject the, the taxpayers to a liability of another, another $60 billion for that one company. Or we can pay people $1.7 billion because we don't have confidence in the appeal process, but we can't keep wells open where 25,000 people of all races, the entire West, West Bank, depend on that industry. It's the choices you make with the money. And so when we look at the wasteful expenditure, you can spend a, a billion dollars on this, this white elephant at Durban Park. <laughs> and they, they, you have no, you know I'm gonna see it then, and a billion on dietary and bringing back the people's militia, but you can't keep wells open. And it is something billion dollars of debt 
I said to the government, if we disaggregate that debt, you will see a significant part of it is long-term debt. They were taking, and if we offset that against the money, the 115 million US dollars that we got from the European Union, the debt would be significantly reduced. Daisuko is carrying debt. Take, for example, for the power, the cogen plant in, in uh, Skeldon that supplied power to GPL at a subsidized rate. But it is on, it is on Gaisuko's book. Most, a lot of those debts are to, G, to the GRA. They could easily be canceled. We offer to help to keep wells open. And then the point about the signal on the rice industry. On the taxation policy itself, it seems many people would say, how come is this discriminatory? And it's a clever, I think, discussion that's taking place, but it's misguided. The discussion goes this way, that Indo-Guyanese own the majority of businesses in Guyana. They, many of that urban elite who engage in the discussion who would not wet their foot uh, and get past the, the borders of Georgetown do not understand that you have many black villages too in the rural countryside. They don't understand that the rice farmers, many of them struggle to make a living. They're not rich people, but they're mistaken belief because the indo guyanese are predominantly the business class, but that there are thousands of them who have a hard time living too in the rice industry and in the sugar industry and in the cash crop industry as well as rural blacks and Amerindians who are facing a hard time. So their belief is that if they are predominantly in production, they, why don't we just charge them a bit more taxes? So the value added tax that we had waived for heavy industry because it helps production if you bring in a tractor, combine, a excavator, a skidder, etc., you don't pay the value added. They surreptitiously reintroduce it. So 16% more you have to pay. And one would have wondered why if I mentioned the steel, because the steel goes to everyone, but it seems as though it's an assault on the productive sector. And the productive sector in their work thinking is primarily um, Indo-Guyanese driven. It's a misguided policy. Our country is integrated. I went to the village next to Dartmouth, Westbury, and I sat in Westbury, and the guys came over from Dartmouth, and they said to me, when the PPP was there, we used to, y'all used to eat, but we used to get the crumbs. With these people, we don't even get the crumbs. <laughs> so, if you don't help the rice industry, the black workers from, who work from Dartmouth and many of the other areas with the rice farmers, etc., they too lose their job. I remember one day when they had a fire, when we had street protests and stuff, and we had a fire on Regent Street, and the, the staff was all standing outside. And I said to someone, look at Guyana. Because although the building was owned by an Indo-Guyanese, the staff looked like Guyana, like our people. You had Amerindians there, Afro-Guyanese, Indo-Guyanese, all losing their jobs. And this government needs to understand that this, they, they can't hurt a, a large section of the country without lurching. Uh, without, without hurting everyone. The next thing about the military, I've heard things said about the military. I support our military. I believe our military has grown in professionalism from the days we took over. We never asked them to perform political tasks and we hope they maintain the professionalism and we we'll always support our military. What we are against is not the military, but this attempt 
to militarize and to use methods that are not provided by our constitution or several of our laws in the, in, in the process. So I don't have a problem with a military man competing for a job too. Why? We need everybody. The, a military person, in fact, I had said, Roger, one time, that our soldiers retire too young. So we must ensure that when they retire, some of them retire at 45, and the senior ones at 55, I think. And I said, get another skill. I asked the chief of staff to see that people started getting another skill, because if a person finishes work at 45, you still have many, many years ahead to contribute to this country. But what we are opposed to is the process through which it's done. You, they just handpicked these people, and half of them had no connection. They're military from abroad, who had retired a long time back. Many of them don't have any skill level. You tell me Van Wesch Charles, Sunlock, he come in to run the GWI. They used to talk about advertisements and stuff for, for senior positions. What kind of advertisement he found there? He's not military, that was a digression. But similarly, you have them as cons around the, the co country. Not, they cannot make a contribution to the sectors in which they are placed because many of them do not have the skill. If they had the skill, yes, fine, but they do not have in the GRA and many other agencies. So let's, the key thing is that the People's Progressive Party is proud of its record. We are not going to be intimidated. <laughs> Secondly, no amount of accusation when we speak up against political and racial discrimination against Guyanese people will cause our voices to be silent. Because if our record is of struggle, is too long. We started in the colonial era, and they did not silence Chetty Jagan and the others. Today, we all must speak up. Not just the leadership of the BBB, but every time you find a case of discrimination based on politics or race, you must speak out too. And never mind all the labels you get, because that's all they can do. They can label us with the hope that the labels would keep us quiet. And so your party has a long history of struggle and will continue to do so. Thank you.